<laughs> Thought that move it over this way, make a little space, and all jurors and alternates are present. Mr. Durst is present with Mr. Karen and Mr. Chesnoff, and of course we have Mr. Lewin, Mr. Milius, Mr. Miata, Mr. Bailey, and Mr. Henderson. And uh, Mr. Karen, you've called Mr. Durst as a witness. Deputy Washington, you may give him the, you may need to hold that microphone. The, the, uh, the my microphone. Him, we'll see if he's audible, but I think he may need my microphone, which is, which is fine. And we have uh, your a lovely judicial assistant. Oh, you'll please uh, come forward so you can give him his uh, oath. Yes, Your Honor. You may remain seated for this, Mr. Durst. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly state that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Okay. If you could please state your first and last name for the record. I don't hear you. Can you please state and spell your first and last name for the record? Robert Durst. R-O-B-E-R-T. D-U-R-S-T. -E -E Thank you. And may I move up there, Your Honor? Yes, you may uh, sit near uh, Mr. Durst. Bob, did you kill Susan Burma? No. Do you know who did? No, I do not. Do you realize you have an absolute right not to testify? I am aware of that. Do you want to testify in your own behalf? Yes. I want to first ask you about some of your health problems. Do you are you hard of hearing? I am hard of hearing. You have uh, hearing aids. Do they help? I have hearing aids. Do they help? Yes. Are you able to hear me without using that screen in front of you? No. I want to ask about your health problems first. I've, I've got lots of them. We've got all day. The health problems that affect me every day, all the time, are hydrocephalus, which, mean, which means my balance is no good. I was operated on and given a shunt, which you can see on my hairline. The shunt is supposed to relieve pressure on my brain. I do believe that it helps me, but I still need a walker to walk around. The other health problem that affects me all the time is that I have COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So when I inhale, my lungs do not remove enough oxygen or as much oxygen as they should. So I find myself constantly having to breathe through my mouth. And there are a whole bunch of things which I'm not really aware of as the day goes on. I have high blood pressure. I have osteoporosis. That means my bones are fragile. I have neuropathy in my right leg below the knee. I have chronic kidney disease. 
point had two major operations for cancer. The first in 2007, they removed my esophagus. That was a major operation. I was in the hospital on morphine for 23 days. The surgeon said that one of the after effects of being on morphine for so long is that I would think more slowly than I did in the past. In 2018, here in Los Angeles, at LAC, USC, I was operated on for bladder cancer. That was a relatively minor operation, but I go back and forth with the urologists. Some of them want to give me a catheter, others say I don't need the catheter. Right now and during this trial, I have a catheter. I think I'm finished. Do you sometimes have difficulty breathing? Yes. And the catheter that you mentioned, of course, is visible to the jurors, the tube coming down from your leg and into the um, device on your wheelchair. Do you want me to hold it up? No, I just want, uh, my question is, is that the result of the catheter? It's the result of having cancer bladder. All right. Bladder, yes, cancer bladder. I want to start with talking about when you were a child. How many brothers or sisters do you have? I have a younger brother who's two years younger than me, named Douglas. My sister is four years younger than me. Her name is Wendy. And I have a little brother whose name is Tommy. And he is seven years younger than me. Your mother, before your mother died, who among your family did you favor and who among your family did your brother Douglas favor? From what I remember as a little kid, whether we were playing go fish or uno or frisbee or whatever, it was always mommy and Bobby against daddy and Douglas. I always loved and loved my mother and I would make an effort to get along with my father. How old were you when your mother died? I was seven years old when my mother died. She was 32. She either jumped or fell from the roof of our book mon monster home in Scarsdale, New York. Were you there when that happened? Yes, it was a typical Sunday night. My grandfather Objection, had come up from the city <coughs> for Sustain. Sunday night dinner. Motion to strike the answer, Your Honor. <laughs> Stricken. Were you what is your recollection of uh, that night when she died? My grandfather 
came into my bedroom and woke me up, walked me out into the hall, pointed out the hall window and said, look, Bobby, there's Mommy on the roof. I looked out the window and there was Mommy on the roof. Now my grandfather did not say, good God, there's Mommy on the roof. It was just very flat. There's Mommy on the roof. Wave at Mommy. So I waved at Motion Mommy. Motion to strike is relevant. You, it's late. Your objection's late. Over. Did you see her fall? I did not see whether she jumped or fell. Did you see her after she fell? I saw her on the roof. I waved at Mommy on the roof. Then I was brought to my bedroom, and shortly thereafter, I heard my father yell, call the fire department. Shortly after that, I heard our maid, Mary, yell, she's off the roof. Then there were lots of people in the house. I know now that it was, if, that it was the police department, the fire department, and the medical examiner's office with lots of people walking around taking photographs. I was kind of left alone. My younger siblings were taken to a neighbor's house. I walked outside and there was mommy. Objection relevant to this point. Also, there's no question pending and it's calling for a narrative. I've let it go for right. a long time. Next question. What did you see? Objection relevant. I Sustain. saw my mother lying Sustain. on a cobble Motion stone to strike. in Stricken. her nightgown. No, no, I don't know that Mr. Durst either. He's not hearing your... No, he isn't. So well, the, well, I'll tell the jury to... If it's I'm, all right, Your Honor, I'll use hand signals to stop when when appropriate. It seemed that you were trying to do that, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. DeGuerin. The jury's to disregard that question and answer. You were here. You were here in the courtroom when your brother Douglas testified that you weren't there. Were you there, and what did you see? My brother Douglas testified that you could not see the part of the roof where my mother fell or jumped from, from the inside hall window. I've repeatedly said the same thing. You look out the window, you see the roof. Anyone could determine the facts of the situation simply by going to 27 Hampton Road, Scoresdale, New York. I went back in 2007. Objection. The right. house is identical. Also also There's an objection. Narrative. Okay, pause. Those are, those are overruled, uh, but uh, no narrative. So let's stop there, and you may ask another question. We have to have it question and answer, Bob. So I will stop you when you go on too long. Understand? I understand. I mean, I know the rules. It just depends how they're handled. <laughs> Did you see your mother in the driveway? Yes, I saw my mother on the driveway. Yes, you know that, Your Honor. And Douglas Durst says that I could not have seen my mother on the roof from the window in the second floor hallway, Douglas Durst was lying. And there were about, about a dozen newspaper articles, magazine articles, questioning whether I could have seen my mother on the roof. 
Now, this is a problem the media has. Let's oh, uh, anyone check the narrative. No. Oh. Gonna, yeah, thank you. I'm stopping that. Uh, the, the, this was a narrative. I'm striking the part about newspaper articles. He said that uh, he said that his brother Douglas was lying. I'll allow that, and we'll strike the rest. So, bottom line, did you see your mother on the driveway? I saw my mother on the driveway, on the cobblestones, in her nightgown. They say she died instantly. For years after that, as you were growing up, did you have problems associated with that? Objection relevant, Your Sustained. Yes. Sustained. Your Honor, we close the side of the Yes. Thank you. Just a moment. Now, Deputy Washington, may I have a word? Hold it, it comes off of the stand, so you, you can just it? hold it loose. I can't. There's some concern about Mr. Durst being audible, so uh, we'll he'll be able to ha use that amplifier, amplified microphone. Mayor, can the court inquire of the jury if, if David thus far able to hear him? Uh, they're all uh, they're nodding, except the farthest juror away is having some trouble hearing. So we'll have, uh, we will have him use the microphone. Thank you, Ron. Following your mother's death, did you blame your father? Yes. Did you have um, Therapy and treatment. Objection, relevance. Sustained. Prior motion as well. Sustained. Did you start running away? Same objection, Your Honor. Yeah. Uh, overall. Seven year old Bobby Durst knew that it was my father's fault. Bobby Durst did not know how or why or anything like that. But Bobby Durst knew. And his father had killed his mother. I started running away. Every couple of weeks, oh, the neighborhood we lived in, there was nothing that was not a book mansion. Giant houses, all had outdoor garages. I quickly learned which houses left their garage doors open. I would go into a garage. Motion to strike at this point as non response and narrative also. We'll, we'll stop there. I don't want a whole uh, narrative uh, about this. Question and answer so that each question may be evaluated. Um, perhaps Mr. Durst can hold that microphone. Uh, can he grab? No? Okay, you can hold the microphone. Perhaps we can make it a little closer to him. Or Mr. Durst, if you will talk right into that microphone. The most important thing is that everybody hear you. How about I take off a mask? Um, let's see. Can I let's take try, off let's try, the try the microphone. Talk, try talking into the microphone, and if necessary, what we may go there. He said try talking into the microphone first, and if that doesn't work, you can take off the mask. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Am I answering a question? No. Not yet. Next question. You mentioned that you started I running. No Why don't you let John tell you what questions he wants me to answer? I'd rather not. I'm available to talk. <clears throat> You'll have your chance. You mentioned you started running away. What were you running away from? Uh, the house. I hated the house. Tommy Durst testified how much I hated the house and how I kept begging my father to move. 
if he never sold the house where his wife died. We sold it all 52. All right, overruled. Uh, you may uh, must object contemporaneously for me to sustain it. Your Honor, does the court want me to interrupt him? I'm trying to. You I'm may listen to the question. If the question is objectionable, you may pose an objection. I will rule on the objection. We'll proceed in that way. Your Honor, how, what does the court want me to do when Mr. Guerin asks a non-objectionable question, but then it just continues and goes into something else? I'm trying to give the witness the respect. You may I'm, object to a narrative. Okay. So, Bob, what that means is, let me ask questions. Don't go into a long narrative, and I'll try to interrupt it with questions. You understand? Hard to give a short narrative. You we'll may see. listen to the question, and you may answer only the question. You may proceed, Mr. DeGuerin. You mentioned that you ran away. You mentioned that uh, there were many houses that had garages that you knew you could hide in. What were you running away from? From the house where my mother died. Overruled. The answer may stand. I'm not sure that uh, it was heard, Your Honor. May he, he said his answer. mother died. No. Next question. Sorry. Did you run away from camp? Get your relevance. Overruled. I ran away from everything. My father kept sending me to see psychiatrists. And all the psychiatrists. <clears throat> Most to strike is non responsive. I'll strike the part about psychiatrists. Did you go to see psychiatrists? Most to strike is irrelevant. No, also well, no, hearsay. No, irrelevant. Yeah. Sustain. Sustain. <clears throat> yes, I saw many psychiatrists. I said, okay, let's oh. uh, pause, pause for a second. So, a uh, couple things. If I. Sustain an objection, you may not answer, Mr. Durst. In that case, I did sustain the objection. That means you could not answer the jury's to disregard the answer and disregard the question. A juror raised uh, his hand, may it have to do with hearing or seeing? Hearing, you make sure the microphone's on. It doesn't sound like it's on. All right, um, let's, let's check that. It's not. Ah, will you press the uh, top, please? <laughs> That's the on button. A green light will illuminate. Excellent. Let's try again with a mic that has been turned on. Gold star for number two. Thank you. Did you run away from school? I ran away from school. I ran away from every place they took me. Eventually, I, uh, yes, I ran away from school. Where did you go to school? I went to Scarsdale Elementary, Fox, Fox Meadow Elementary School and Scarsdale High School. Did you graduate from high school? Yes, I did. barely graduated from high school because I never spent any time there. Did you uh, go to college? I went to Lehigh University, L-E-H-I-G-H. -E where is Lehigh University located? In Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Let me finish my question. In Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? Yes. Is that near where you were arrested after uh, Morris Black died? Uh, exactly where I was arrested. 
I was arrested in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We'll get to that. Not yet. How did you do in Lehigh? Did you graduate? I managed to graduate, yes. After uh, Lehigh, uh, what was going on in the, in the country? Was that during the time of the, v uh, the Vietnam War? Yes. And uh, were you draft eligible? I was available, but for whatever the reason is, probably because I had seen so many psychiatrists. Objection, relevance. Draft board never calls me. <clears throat> All right, the draft board never called you. Motion to strike. I'll strike it. Non responsive. Did the draft board ever call you? No. Objection, relevance. Sustained. Well, did you go into the service? Objection, relevance. Sustained. Well, this is his background, Your Honor. Yes. What did you do? I don't know what the question is. What did you do after Lehigh? Did you go into the service? Did you go into the... No, I went to UCLA. How did you get into UCLA? I applied to... I, uh, I applied to half a dozen graduate schools, and I was accepted in some of them. One of them was UCLA. What sort of graduate courses were, were you looking to take? Objection relevance. Oh, well. I was in the PhD economics program. Is economics something that was of interest to you at the time? Sort of, I guess. So why did you choose UCLA? It seemed like it should be. Los Angeles, Hollywood, movies, it sounded like fun. And was it fun? Yes. Tell the jury about how you met Susan Berman. Well, after my first year at UCLA, 1966, friends of mine from New York, Stuart Altman and his younger brother Eric, came out and visited me. The Beta Theta Pi fraternity house in Westwood had a big sign out front that said, rooms for rent. So the three of us rented a big room for the summer. This Were you a member of Beta Theta Pi, or was did you just rent a room from them? I had nothing to do with Beta Theta Pi, just rented the room. Okay, go ahead. How did you meet Susan Berman? So one night, what we did all summer long was to hang out at the Dykstra Pool, just west of UCLA's main campus, south of Sunset. I guess everybody knows that. There are a bunch of dormitories and a big recreation center. First dorm that was built was called Dykstra, D-Y-K-S-T-R-A. And we spent the summer by the pool trying to pick up girls. One night I got back to the fraternity house around nine or 10, and Stuart Altman introduced me to the girl that he had picked up that afternoon. Her name was Susan Berman. I readily found out that both her parents were dead and that her father 
had owned hotels in Las Vegas and had something to do with the mob. I stop you. When you first met Susan Berman, did you and she hit it off? Yes. Explain that to the jury. Well, the only thing Stuart Altman was interested in was the fact that Susan Berman had decided that she was going to keep it until she got married. So Stuart wandered off someplace, and Susan and I stayed up all night and talked. Stephen Silverman, who testified, said that when you have a conversation with Susan Berman, you listen. Well, whatever it was, that night I was relatively talkative, and we spent the whole night talking. So what did you, uh, what did you find in common with you and Susan? Well, both of us were raised by other, others than our parents. Her parents were both dead. Her father died when she was seven. Her mother died when she was 12. My father, my mother died when I was seven. My father couldn't handle me because I kept running away. And he kept sending me to see psychiatrists. The psychiatrist. Objection, motion to strike is non responsive. Also, it's a narrative. All right, we are at a narrative. And let's see, just a moment. The psychiatrist stuff I'm asking to be stricken. Well, I will. I'm looking at anything else. No, I don't think so. We'll, we'll strike really the, the psychiatrist part. The rest may stand. Your Honor, could Mr. Durst be instructed not to bring up? anything about psychiatrists unless he specifically asked because it's coming up frequently. Yeah, listen to the question and answer only the question. Was, was there a period of time uh, in your youth where you were sent to see psychiatrists on a regular basis? Objection 315. Sustained. Yeah, that's sustained. 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 Mr. DeGarren, are you weary? I, I, I sustain this objection already. I just stopped him, Your Honor. I know, but you asked the same question and only to stop him. Don't do that, please. Ask questions. Don't ask questions uh, to which an objection will be sustained. And I've already made clear what will be sustained. Was your father an absentee father? Objection relevance. Sustained. My father was sustain. If I sustain an objection, do not answer the question. Next question, please. So, how did you feel that you and Susan had things in common? We were both rich. Susan had a trust fund and paid her $2,500 a month. Susan had a Mercedes Benz SL. That first night we met, and it got to be morning, she took me out to her car, and we drove to Ship's Restaurant on West, in Westwood. And we pretty much talked until it was lunchtime. All right, so. You meet Susan Berman, uh, you hit it off with her immediately, you stay up all night talking, you go to Ship's restaurant uh, the next day. Did your friendship with Susan continue? Yes, we stayed friends. The next year, I applied to Claremont Graduate School. All right. Now, where is Claremont Graduate School? It's in Claremont, California. It's 
It's about an hour and 15 minutes east of Los Angeles. Now, was this during your uh, school at uh, UCLA? Did you interrupt your school at UCLA? I just left UCLA for the one year I went to Claremont Graduate School, and then I went back to UCLA. In the meantime, then, what did Susan do? Susan graduated from UCLA, and she applied to Berkeley's Graduate School in Journalism, where she was accepted. At the time, I believe, Berkeley's journalism program was considered the best in the West. I think it still is. At least. All right. So Susan went to Berkeley in Northern California, right? Right. And you went to Claremont Graduate School. And then I went back to UCLA. All right. So after Susan moved to Northern California to attend Berkeley. What did you do? We visited each other frequently. Bob, Bob, were you and Susan ever lovers? No, no. How would you characterize your friendship? As friends. All right, in the next few years, what happened? As, as far as you and Susan. In uh, 1968, I applied to become a VISTA, a volunteer in service to America. Well, let me stop you there. What gave you the idea to become a VISTA volunteer? They had a table at UCLA with information about VISTA. I walked by and I liked it, and I applied to become a VISTA. And uh, where was Susan Berman at that time? Susan had become, I guess first, she graduated from journalism school about the same time as I went into Vista. She got a job with the San Francisco Chronicle. And after one year, she went to work for something that was called City Magazine. Is that a local publication in San Francisco? Yes. It was very popular, but it did not last very long. But Susan became a star. She wrote an article, a cover article, called Why I Can't Get Laid in San Francisco. And this made the front page of the magazine and the new San Francisco Chronicle picked it up on their front page, too, with a big picture of Susan. Were you proud of her success? Well, I sort of thought it was the wrong thing for her career, but she liked it, and she got lots of job opportunities from it. In the meantime, what were you doing uh, as a VISTA volunteer? Well, being a VISTA volunteer was interesting. They, did, they sent me to Watts, and I lived in Watts, and I worked for an agency. Can I get some water? Yes.
You mentioned <clears throat> you mentioned they sent you to Watts. Uh, what year was this? 1969. Was this uh, what was the situation in Watts during that uh, time? Objection relevance. The state. What was Vista uh, doing there? Objection relevance. What did you do? Objection relevance. Over. They set up my program. All of us were in some way related to business. And we were supposed to help the people in business in Watts. Mostly if you're getting bank loans, small business Richard administration loans. 352 loan. as well. Overall, move on though. Uh, Your Honor, but he yes. it, so I'm not sure the jury heard the answer because he was speaking over. Everybody hear the answer? They're nodding. I heard it. Everybody heard it. Thank you. Go ahead. Is was Vista more or less a domestic peace corps? Yes. And so, how long were you associated with Vista, and in what? For a year. What did you physically do as a VISTA volunteer? I met with small business people in Watts and I helped them fill out small business administration applications. In some cases, I co signed loans. Objection relevance. Overall. You may continue. Your Honor, may we, no. approach, Your Honor no. may we approach, please? No, uh, but the narrative ends. Next question. So, uh, helping small businesses get loans for business, I presume, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And what else did you do? That's what I did. All right. How long were you in that program? A year. And then what did you do? Well, I read this that at the time there was something called the Whole Earth Review. And it was kind of a hippie book magazine. And I read about an article about people opening health food stores, mostly in New England. So I got the idea that I would go to New England and open a health food store, really a health food general store. All right, I'll ask you about that in a moment. But did you uh, return to UCLA before you went to New England? No, I just left. So you did not graduate from... Did not get a degree, no. Okay. All right. Uh, so you got the idea that you wanted to have a health food store, but more or less a general store in New England. Is that right? Yes. What did you do in order to accomplish that? Well, my father owned a big house an hour and a half north of New York City. It was a typical rich person's house on 11 acres, a glass house on top of a hill with a pool and a tennis court. So I called up Dad and asked him if it was all right if I moved into the Katona house, K-A-T-O-N-A-H. Dad had bought it because everybody felt he should not have to stay in the city during the weekends. The thing it was is that Dad loved the city 
and having this house was more of a problem than a solution. So, uh, what was your plan about the Katona house that your father owned and was not using? I just moved into it. Dad wanted me to go into the family business, which is called the Durst Organization. And at that time, was one of probably the top 10 owners of office space in Manhattan. Did you want to go into the Durst Organization business? No. Uh, I want to ask a little bit about the history of the Durst Organization. There's been uh, some evidence that it was uh, a tradition for the oldest member of the family to take over the business. How many uh, siblings did Seymour Durst have? Seymour Durst had four siblings. Who started the Durst organization? My grandfather, Joseph Durst. Joseph and Rose Durst had five children, from oldest to youngest. They were Edwin Durst, Alma Durst, Askin, Seymour Durst, my father, Royal Durst, and David Durst. So, was if, if it had been the tradition for the oldest sibling to take over, that would not have been Seymour, was, was it? No, it was never like that. What was it like? Well, Edwin Durst just didn't like it. So I wasn't there, but seemingly from the very beginning, he did not like New York City and he did not like the real estate business. So my grandfather gave up trying to get Edwin Durst to run the business. So the next oldest one was my father, Seymour Durst. Did Seymour run the business after your grandfather gave it up? Yes. All right. And basically what was and is the Durst organization business in New York. In New York City, particularly in Manhattan, all the properties are very small. So if you're going to build a big building, you have to buy up a whole bunch of little properties and get the tenants out. New York City has very strong rent control laws. I think a lot stronger than out here. Once a tenant is in a residential facility, they can stay there until they die, as long as they pay the rent. So the business was buying small buildings, removing the tenants, demolishing the small buildings, using the land for parking until you got enough little buildings together to build a big building. So was that more or less the business plan of the Durst organization? That was it. Did you have any interest in doing that? Well, that summer, when I was 69, I spent... You just said, that summer when I was 69. Are you talking about the year 1969? Uh, I'm sorry. I meant to say 1969. Okay, that summer. Go ahead. I spent a lot of time driving around New England and looking at little towns, trying to find a place where I would be comfortable 
living and running a store. And Were you living at the Katona house by then? Yes. And, and Dad kept leaning on me to come into the business so he could show me the business. Did you want to do that? No. What did you want to do? I wanted to go open my store someplace. And that was but, the idea that you had come across when you were a VISTA volunteer and when you were in uh, school in California? When I finished my VISTA program, I left Los Angeles and moved to New York. VISTA was the past. And so, uh, when you were driving, you just testified you were driving around New England looking for a place for to start a store. Was that the plan that you had from California? Yeah. Um, all right. Did you did you find a place that you thought would be good? for your plan to have a health food store or a general store in New England? Yes, Middlebury, Vermont. It's a small town with a very selective college. Middlebury College is one of the most selective small colleges in the country. So describe, if you will, what you thought was uh, ideal for your plan to have a health food store and a general store. Section relevant to 352. Or, uh, I guess the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> That's not the, no, that wouldn't be an appropriate answer. Here, let me repeat my question. Did you find that uh, Middlebury, Connecticut, Middlebury, uh, Vermont, was an ideal place for your plan for a uh, health food store and general store? The answer is yes. What was it about that place that caused you to make that decision? It was quaint. I, I really don't know. There was no competition. There were lots of towns that would have been great, but somebody had already gotten there. Okay, so what did you find? What were you able to do? I leased space, 4,000 square feet in Middlebury, Vermont. Kind of lease to open the store. And did you have a place to live there? Objection 352, Your Honor. I rented the downstairs of my Overruled. house. Overruled. Oh, go ahead. For eight, for eight dollars a month. Eighty? Eight oh? Eight? Did you say eighty dollars a month? The store rent was $130 a month. The apartment rent was $80 a month. Did you have sufficient income to pay that rent? Yes, from the time I was 18, there were family trusts that paid me an income. That's when I answered before one of the things Susan Berman and I both had in common is that we both had trust funds set up by our parents. Okay, when you find this uh, store to rent or, and you find a house to rent or home to rent in Middlebury, was it your plan to live in Katona or to live in Middlebury? The plan 
was living in Middlebury. You had been living at the Katona house, right? Yes, and I left things in one of the bedrooms. I would periodically go to New York and stay at the Katona house. And I went along with Dad's desire and I would visit the business. I can't say I worked there. I would just go and go to some meetings and things Objection, Eric. that Dad wanted me to do. Okay, okay I need to we'll stop there. Questions. Uh, we'll pause. Uh, yes, it's be becoming a narrative. We have uh, ordinarily one lawyer, not two, object. Are you passing the torch to Mr. Bailey and Mr. Lewin? No. Oh. <laughs> Then, yeah, he's uh, objected one, uh, more than me. No, rules, no. Court, rules <laughs> court provide for one one attorney to perform a task at a time. Otherwise, I got Tenny uh, doing it, and uh, no, well, you'll uh, drive uh, me, uh, uh, really Mr. Drive me Mr. crazy. Mr. Bailey was just over-enthusiastic, Your Honor, trying to win this one. Well, well that's the pot calling <laughs> the kettle black. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Enough fun. Back to work. Next question. Who else lived at the Katona house? when you were there? When I got there, there was nobody there. But sometime that fall, my brother Douglas decided that he wanted to work in the family business. And he moved into the same house in Katona, New York with his wife and his two children. What was the relationship between you and Douglas Durst at that time? We never liked one another. Fortunately, the house was very big, and he could have his end of it, and I could have my end of it, and I was hardly there anyway. So where were you spending your time? I was spending my time in Middlebury. Just as an aside, where was Susan Berman and what was she doing while this was going on, while you were starting your store in Middlebury? Susan had this great success with her cover article about not being able to get laid. And she had stayed with City Magazine. And at some point, around 1969 or 1970, Susan decided that she wanted to write a book about her life story of growing up in Las Vegas. Her father's name was Davy Berman, who was a well-known associate of Bugsy Siegel. Bugsy Siegel's right hand man, he was called. All right. And so, so she uh, wanted I think, to. I think we'll take a little uh, uh, break now. We we had a sort of a long break earlier, longer than I planned. But I think a short break for everyone in case you need just uh, to rearrange ourselves. So let's uh, let's take it. Let's take uh, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Let's go to three forty-five. Do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not come in this case regarding <coughs> information about Mr. Dirk's activities that relate to the case or information that attaches <coughs> certain witnesses who have testified. It is quite another for them to put on a narrative of kind of poor little rich boy and then interpose things like, and I, maybe the court didn't hear my objection. I objected when Mr. Durst volunteered that in addition to arranging loans, he said sometimes he would give them the loans himself, no. which, is, which, which is clearly an attempt by Mr. Durst to try and appear to this jury as if he has certain attributes that are clearly relevant. So my issue, Your Honor, and I want to respect the court's position, if the court believes that all this is relevant, and this isn't privy to, then I'm not going to object, but I'm trying to understand how questions about what rent he paid in all good things in the late 60s 
How, that's not relevant to anything that we put on. It's not relevant to any defense they have. And I'm concerned. I'm secondarily concerned with the idea, and it hasn't happened for a while, that Mr. Durst wants to bring up his treatment by a psychiatrist. As the court's aware, the defense had ample opportunity, in fact, they said they were going to do it, to call a mental health expert to testify to these things. I don't know if the court is aware of it, but in the Galveston trial, the reason that they later said they did not call an expert in Galveston was because they were able to get Mr. Durst to testify about this information without objection. So my concern is that what we've got here is we've got an attempt to kind of sneak in this information by Mr. Durst without any cross-examination. So those are the issues, and I'm hoping the court can provide some guidance and also sure. to mention to Mr. Durst that he is not to mention anything. The word psychiatrist should not come out of his mouth. <clears throat> Mr. Lewin, first of all, you're not correct that Mr. Durst testified that he gave loans. He did say he co-signed VISTA loans. I'm not sure what that means. It does not mean personally giving a loan. He did mention psychiatrists. I've stricken that at every occasion. and each occasion, it's non-responsive. Had there been a question about psychiatry or psychological treatment, I would have sustained your objection. The jury should not hear about uh, psychiatry. Not only that, it doesn't amount to a defense. I'm not instructing on any psychiatric defense unless there's some evidence of it. None has been presented. So are you, I have given you enormous leeway in giving context to your presentation. I'm giving some leeway to the defense on the idea that, that Mr. DeGuerin is going to tie this into relevant evidence. However, the entirety of a person's experience is that, that may be relevant to the case is not simply the facts and circumstances of the commission of crimes. Therefore, I'm going to let the defense have some leeway to present a story in a coherent way that it, that it includes, hopefully, the, the, the uh, specifics behind his initial denial of responsibility. This is why, Your Honor, I, as the court's aware, I was not objecting much. I am concerned, of course, right, when he says, though, that he's co-signing, in the end, um, whether he's giving the loan or co-signing the loan, that is still an irrelevant issue that is certainly in injected as a means of making look at it as if Mr. Durst is a certain kind of individual, et yes. cetera. People, people try to make themselves look good with uh, adding a word or two to their, uh, to their answers. If that specific word isn't responsive. The balance of the answer was responsive. I wasn't going to strike his answer because he volunteered a word or two that made him look good. If you want to cross-examine him about his co-signing of, of loans for people uh, who he was helping through the VISTA program, that's fine. It seemed to me that you explored the circumstances of his development of a friendship with Susan Berman. This is the other side of that. He's describing how their lives intersected and when they did not, why they did not. So I'm giving the defense, as I said, a little bit of leeway to make a coherent presentation. That is the reason why I've overruled some of your objections and that is uh, the spirit with which I will rule on, on future objections. No problem, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Recess.